I'm Susanna Herculana Huzel. I'm an associate professor at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Oh, yeah, the 100 billion neurons in the human brain, that's the number that appears in major textbooks on the internet. You can uh, write it in the opening paragraph of your review papers without ever bothering to give a reference. It's as good a truth as genes are made of DNA. Who gives a reference for that anymore, right? And you open textbooks and it's right there, so you just take it for the truth. The way that people could count neurons or any other type of cells in, in brains was, and still is, stereology, which essentially amounts to taking whole brains, slicing them up perfectly, and then subsampling a few sections under the microscope. So you look up how many cells you find in a given volume or within a given uh, little dissector, just a probe that you place on the, on the sections. And that works beautifully provided that you know how to do it appropriately and that you're looking at a structure that's very homogeneous in the distribution of cells. So it works perfectly for small parts of the brain. You want to count how many cells you have in the thalamus and in, in motor nuclei, that's fine. But if you want to apply that to the whole brain, you run into the problem of how different the distribution of neurons is from one millimeter to the next. It's, it's like taking a, a whole without knowing what you're doing, how people are distributed or how they're concentrated, uh, you get a result, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's, a, it's a good result, that it really represents the truth, let's say, what you're going for. So it made it very difficult for people to actually get estimates of how many neurons composed whole brains of different species, much less a human brain, which is really large. I think it was... Uh, um, mixture of different factors that got this magic number propagated so long and along with it that story that we have 10 times as many glial cells as neurons in the human brain which is just so not true. <laughs> So what, what made me realize that we didn't know the first thing about what brains are made of was a um, survey that I ran at a science museum in Brazil where I started working after I got my PhD. Um, and I ran a survey with people who visited the, the museum on a number of things about the brain, like um, 80% of people like, agreed that without a brain there's no conscience. Great, right? 60% of college-educated people in Rio accepted that myth that we only use 10% of the brain. Now, I still don't know where that myth came from, but I started looking around and one of the possibilities was that, well, you open textbooks and there it was. So that's what, uh, when, I, when I saw that and I, I realized that uh, it could be the source of this 10% thing, I started going through the literature and I asked a number of prominent neuroscientists um, where do these numbers come from? Do you know whoever actually counted and found that there are 100 billion neurons in the brain, in the human brain, and 10 times as many glial cells? And everybody was like, um, I actually don't, but those are the numbers, aren't they? Um, so it was really a game of telephone. It's just, it's just hearsay. But I, I, I went digging through the literature, and that's when I realized that everybody thought that everybody else had already figured this out, but nobody actually had. So the, the, the average that we have so far is a total of 86 billion neurons and just as many non-neuronal cells, which includes not just glia, but also the endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are probably around 20% of all of the non-neuronal cells. That's something that we're working on now. Um, but that still leaves less than one glial cell per neuron 
in the brain as a whole. Now, that's the, 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 the thing is that this ratio between how many glial cells and how many neurons you have, that's highly variable across different parts of the, of the brain. So you can have two or maybe even three glial cells per neuron in some parts of the cortex and less than 0.01 in the cerebellum, meaning you have many, many more neurons than glial cells. Getting those numbers for the first time was really exhilarating. Bef well before that, we had mice and rats, which, you know, they're just mice and rats. And I, I remember thinking, I know something that nobody else does. But the next thought is, well, I need to get the word out now because this is useless if I know this but nobody else does. So it, it was about the same thing with the humans, with the bonus that once we had those numbers, we, can, we could actually start comparing them to other species. And that's where you realize um, that um, compared to other primates, we're just that generic primate with a 1.2 kilogram brain. And to me, that's the most important part about having the numbers. It's not just the numbers per se, it's what you can do with them. I think people very rapidly realized that we really did not know these numbers and we really needed those numbers, not just in the human brain, but in a number of other species if we were to find out some basic fundamental properties of how brains develop, how they evolve, how they're put together, how they function, what the constraints are. The, the, the pushback was really from people who were maybe very comfortable with the ideas, the notions that we had until then that were really just based on intuitions like the human brain is special. It has to be, right? Because we don't have the largest brain around, so how come we study elephants and they don't study us if their brain is this big and ours is just big enough to fit inside the head? There has to be something that's out of the ordinary about the human brain. So when we came out and said that we really had just a large primate brain that was, on top of that, there was no much bigger than you would expect for the size of a primate body, um, some, some people could just not take that. And you read and reviews that um, this cannot be true, which is just frustrating because that's not what scientists were supposed to say, that this cannot be true. Fun science fiction aside, we're really the ones studying mice and elephants and whatnot and not the other way around. So I, I think it's very understandable to get this feeling that there has to be something very distinctive about humans. Now the thing is, this something distinctive doesn't necessarily mean that we've been singled out by nature or whatever other agent to become an exception to the, to the rules, which was the feeling for a couple of centuries. We know today that evolution just means change, not necessarily for the better or for worse, it's just change over time, which means that humans are really just one more species. So, but it was in that context of humans coming on top, human, humans being the crown achievement of evolution, that a lot of the, the most basic concepts were, were generated. My name is Susanna Herculano-Gazelle and I'm a neuroscientist.